Paul wasn't scared. So God's people, are not, they're not going to be scared when they're, when they're standing before the UN Council of Justice or like their face is going to be lit up like an angel and they're going to be causing the, the people putting them on trial to, trial to tremble. Just in the light of all that's transpiring around us, the threatenings, the rapid progress that we're seeing and the movements of the enemy, it's easy to lose sight of the power of God when we look at it. It's easy to, for it to mask it you with know, our finite vision, just for us to get lost in it, you know, and be overcome with fear. So I've titled this study, Unprofitable Servants. It's a mixture of ideas, but this is the parable that I want to begin with. Before the parable about the unprofitable servants, Jesus says this after the disciples asked him to increase their faith. He says, And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. According to this, the smallest particle of real faith, of tested faith, it moves the hand of God. It's not given to give part, do, for us to do party tricks, but the Bible tells us that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's in 1 John 5, 14. The, that power is given that we might perform his desi designs. The Bible always, often talk, talks about faith as being of the smallest thing you can imagine. You know, in um, Matthew 13, in verse 13, it says, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we see the mustard seed faith, the, the faith of, of little children, becoming like little children. See, little children's faith is, is, is perfect. You know, like I've experienced that now. You know, my, my son, when he approaches a, a flight of stairs, if he's by himself, he'll carefully turn around and walk backwards and go down the stairs. But if I'm within arm's reach, he'll just nonchalantly dive in my direction. You know, they, 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 have, no, they have complete trust that you're going to, catch them they they don't doubt at all you know he even laughs as he falls over sometimes and where we have to be like that towards god if we want to enter into the kingdom of heaven according to that verse i just read to have that that level of trust in god regardless of how bad things might look and that's what that's what all this is that is happening is really is really going to bring out in us If we let it. Another thing about little children is they don't desire praise. There's no pretentiousness in the act, little acts they do. When they do something, they just they just do it, and and it's it's normal for them. They don't they don't do things in order for people to praise them or or or, or um, you know be thanked or anything. You know, little children anyway. They do some amazing things and you're shocked, but they just, they just do them. You know? Little children are completely content with the love and the, just the presence of their parents and the acceptance of them. The parents often corrupt their children by praising them and clapping all the time and that they actually ruin them. They ruin them by that because then they start to do things in order to be praised rather than doing things just, just because that's what, they, that's what they should do and, and what they enjoy doing. They start to instead stop enjoying what they're doing and just focusing on getting the praise and the clapping and all that. And it, it really ruins them. You know, the Pharisees, they did all, all, everything they did was to be seen of men, was to receive praise and honor. So really like little children, they, they, don't, they don't do it for that reason. They do things just because for the love of it, for the love of their parents. They have no... They have no, no, none of this pretentiousness and falsehood in them. So in the context of what he says here about the faith of a grain of mustard seed and, 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 in, and similarly as the faith of a little child, the parable, can, the parable starts. Jesus says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come in from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say to him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, 
and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trow not, or I think not. In other words, he says to his servant, after you're done from doing your hard work out in the field, then you come and, you come and make, make my dinner, and after that you can eat. See, because he's his servant. He's, he, that's, his, that's his duty. He's not going to thank him for what he's done or praise him for it. That's what he's expected of him. And likewise, when we, when we do something, we shouldn't expect thanks or praise from God. We're not gonna, God when we get to heaven, God's not going to say thank you. you know, we're going to say thank you to him. You know, he, sure, he's going to honor us. He's going to honor us with, as being part of his sufferings. But the things we do are our duty. It's not, it's not, we don't do it for praise. That, that's what all the religions of the world teach, by the way, that the, you, you gain merits in praise. And that's what the Pharisee said when he sat, stood there and prayed, I thank thee, God, that I am not like other men. You know, you think me better than them because of all these good things I, I've done. You know, God, God values all, all sinner or saint, they're the same value. They're still souls he died for. So after this parable about the, the servant and the master, Jesus says, so likewise ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Notice there, when he says that, you know, we're unprofitable servants. Before he said that, he said, you know, you can, you can throw a sycamine tree in the, in the ocean. So these unprofitable servants who think very low of themselves are throwing trees in the ocean. They're doing amazing miracles. So these things don't inflate, inflate them. They, they, they remain humble. You know, if you, got, if you receive this power, you've, you, you, you know that you're an unprofitable servant because not only is God, doing, is God performing it through you, is God giving you the will and desire to do, those, to do the, the things that you do, but you understand that you are undeserving and, and because of your sins worthy of death. So really, there's no, there's no reason for praise or uh, thinking you're entitled to thanks or, you know, because we know, we know what our past is like and we know our failings of our lives. We have, what we have done is believed and moved as directed and that is, that is our duty. But the time is coming when God's people will be casting mountains into the ocean so to speak different amazing miracles i don't know if particularly that but things that are just incredible and the power that they will be will harness is going to be amazing it'll be it'll be it'll shock the entire world but it's just, just it, creative power will be exercised through them to heal rise rise people from the dead um just incredible things but right now to all Appearances, the power of the enemy is unstoppable when we look around. If you know what they're up to, if you don't, if you're not brainwashed by the news, you can see the power of the movings of the enemy are incredible. And there's no match for them on this earth. And it really is concerning. Like it, it, it concerns me when I think about it. I think of, I, have, I have dreams sometimes about all this stuff that's happening. And, you know, you imagine things. Like you can see in this picture here, I'm not saying, I don't know if this is going to happen, but these are the sorts of scenarios we're imagining that could happen, you know, the way they're talking about it. There's some, a lot of lunatic lawyers and doctors talking about doing this sort of stuff. If you see them, if you've seen the quotes of them online, there's people that actually believe this should happen. You know, that's, that's quite alarming. But Jesus said this, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground with, without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do you believe that? I, I believe that. I do. I believe that God does number our hairs. And you know, I know that he watches over us. But you know, there's a, there's, a lot, there's a test coming for all of us to see how much we believe this. The disciples, he said this, these words to the disciples. He said it in their, in their hearing, right? They were there, face to face. But they, they, didn't, they didn't really believe this in, in reality. When the test came, 
in other words, what, what, what Jesus is saying here is nothing can happen to you or anyone without my allowing it. Everything is under my control. Because the disciples, their unbelief was, was quite shocking after what happened when Jesus, when, when, um, after the cross. We read about what the disciples were happening, happening to them. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, and they mourned and wept. So they were mourning and weeping. What, and, and what happened? And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. So they had been told repeatedly by Jesus himself that he was going to rise. He was going to be killed and rise and rise after the third day. Now they're being told by Mary Magdalene and they still don't, they, they don't believe it. They didn't believe him. They didn't believe her. Now she, she came and told them what, just repeating what he said to them before, repeatedly before. And then after that, after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the, unto the residue, the disciples, neither believed they them. So now they're, they're being told from all these different people, but they still, they still won't believe it. It's just incredible to, for us to be able to understand how they could still not believe it after so much evidence. So but what was their problem? Why were the disciples rendered so faithless? Why did the cross destroy their hopes? You know, we know that they had cherished, cherished beliefs of this earthly kingdom. But did they believe Jesus was the Son of God? They did. They did before anyway. They, they totally did. They experienced the power. They performed the miracles. Were, were they full of selfishness? No. They, they just had the Last Supper and they had foot washing. And they, they, that had been, apart from Judas, they'd all been, Jesus said that you're all now clean. So they, they, they had their doctrines right. They had a good heart. Why did they, why did they have such unbelief? You know, their doctrines were all correct. The circumstances changed from being with Jesus and being untouchable. Um, and their faith collapsed. It was completely collapsed. So really, when you boil it down, what they, they, they saw the power of he that is in the world, or the devil, as more powerful than, than God, really. They couldn't, they couldn't see past the circumstances around them. Fear just completely consumed them. They, 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 didn't, they didn't have the faith to, over, to look past circumstances and what was visually in, in present with them. You know? So I just want to say all their doctrines correct and they weren't selfish, but they still couldn't look past the circumstances. Like, that's, a, that's kind of scary like you know, for God's people. That happened to them, you know. The evidence of their senses were, and appearances were greater than the evidence of God's word to them. So, really, when the, when the, when the test comes, we'll know, you know. Faith has to be tested and matured by circumstances and tests. It has to be, or else it's just, it's just speculation. You know, it's, it really is, even, even, even in us, um, we have to. Our faith has to be proven in order for us to to really receive the power that God wants to give us. As I was saying, you know, right now the enemy, enemy's power is, is quite un, unrivaled. You know, we're, they've been lockdowns. We're banned from meeting in church meetings um, from time to time. Banned from travel. They're trying to roll out mandatory vaccines on us. And the majority of the world is just totally hypnotized. They're going to follow like the Pied Piper off the edge of the cliff. You know, so it looks like the, the power of the enemy is, is, is unrivaled. But the reality is, 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 is not. It's not. It's not. It's absolutely limited. The Bible says that there is no power, no power but of God. See, the, the disciples were so scared. It says that then at the same time at evening... Being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They came in and shut and locked the doors. They were hiding themselves away. They thought they were next. 
So, but there's no power that of God. When, when Paul says this in Romans 13, let, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Any power that a ruler has obviously is, is allowed to fall into their hands from God. But at the same, also, God is the ultimate arbiter over every soul's destiny, whether they live or die. There's no, 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 no ruler, no authority, no man has any power over another man unless God is, God is allowing it to happen. You know, that's what Jesus says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows, he, he, he is able to save you or allow you to die a martyr's death according to his, his will. Whatever happens to you is, is in his hands. You know, that's, that's what the disciples, they didn't really believe. You know, in Deuteronomy, it says, See now then, I, even I, I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. But God is the ultimate judge and decider of, a, of the destiny of every human being. The enemy can, be, can do nothing without his, his allowing it to happen. And we have to remember as we see all this transpiring in the world there are all this government oppression these toxic vaccines being rolled out these fema camps and all the terrible things they're doing it's all happening under god's eye and you know and in a sense it's the withdrawing of god's spirit and people are generations for the generations that have that have been especially since the 1960s people are just getting they're reaping what they've sown these things have to happen these, all these oppression and all this stuff has to happen. People have to learn what the consequences of sin are. Unfortunately, innocent people suffer, which is always the case with sin. But we have to always keep that in mind, that all that is happening is happening under God's eye. And it's part of the, part of even these bad things that these people are doing are part of the way that the world is being punished for their forgetfulness of God. For example, when people don't, we don't want God's health message, which is temperance, natural surroundings, eating a you know, natural diet. And they would rather have Satan's health message, you know. They, 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 since they won't have God's health, won't obey God's health principles, Satan gives them an, uh, an alternative, which is just live as you like and come in and get a, a shot full of mercury and aborted fetus DNA. And you see, it's just... What's happening is, is just the consequence of, of just a falling away of, of mass scale of humanity. Anyway, we've covered that in other sermons, but we're not to let all the events get to us in a sense that get angry with the people doing it so much because it's just part of the, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled for these things must come to pass. And there's no power but of God. God is over, God's eye is over everything that's happening in the world. And Jesus understood this throughout his whole, all of his passion, his suffering. He understood, his, his faith saw the omnipotence of God above all worldly powers. We read this when he was in Pilate's judgment hall. And Pilate went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. He's asking him, Are you the Son of God? But he, he already answered that. He said he's not going to keep. He's not going to keep telling him. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. The worldly rulers and might think they have power right now over God's people or over everyone, even even everyone else, but they really. They really have no power except it's given them of God. They can't do anything to you or you or I or anyone else in the world for that matter without it being given to them of God. You know? like same for Jesus and same for, same for us. So really there's nothing to fear with anything that, that happens. If, if we, we have to have that faith, that faith of, of Jesus. You know? After the resurrection and Jesus appeared to them, the disciples became believing servants. But they were worthy of rebuke, as we read here. Afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. So, so they didn't believe, didn't believe Mary or the other two. 
and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So, you know, we should believe our brethren when they tell us things. And you've got to snap out of it because you've got work to do. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So he gets straight into it. He doesn't, doesn't really doesn't dwell on it. We've got to move forward now. You know? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils and shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So these promises that were given in, before the, the former rain are also for those that receive the latter rain. They're for us, they're for God's people that are going to be blessed to, to give that final message. And, you know, some pretty amazing power is being spoken of here. Um, you know, uh, obviously the healing and, and miraculous tongues, but he says that if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. We know that Apostle Paul, when he, when he was on that island in Malta, he was bitten by the snake and he was fine. When it says things like this, if they, even if they, they, it does come to when, they, when if they're going to pin you down and force you to take a vaccination, it's not going to hurt you according to this. It doesn't apply if you, if you willingly take it out of convenience because you don't want to lose your job or something like that. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't, that's not what that means. You've got to do your best to, to um, you know, provide your body with the, the best health it needs. What we, this, is, this is talking about things that, we, that are out of our control. If someone slips you a, a poisonous drink or wants to force something into you, this is, this, this is what that means. Um, so nothing can touch you. Nothing, can, ha- nothing can, can happen to you unless God allows it to happen. We know amazing things happen to the, the disciples. John was put in a boiling pot of oil, according to the church fathers, and he wasn't burned. The worthies were thrown in the fire and they were, they were fine. So God can protect you if it's his will. And if it's not, it's not. But either way, there's nothing to worry about. Just to um, go over the, the way that the disciples changed over that period between the death and the, and the, the pouring out of, the, of the, the Spirit, I just wanted to make a little chart here. So in that period after, while Jesus was in the tomb, they were mourning, weeping, and hiding. They were totally faithless. But then they, between the resurrection and Pentecost, they were, they were believing. The Bible says in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, some of the things that were happening around that time. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 2, I'll just read verses 2 and 3. Until the day in which he was taken up, Jesus was taken up, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So they, he spent forty days with them. It says here that they were giving a commandments. He was uh, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. No doubt they were, I'm, I'm sure they were studying prophecies and, and such. And then afterwards, they, after he was taken up, after 40 days of being with them, there was, there was a period between when he was taken up and the, the pouring out of the Spirit. Probably what was just a, not many days, but they spent that time studying the prophecies of Christ with new eyes. You can see that they discovered many prophecies. about Ju- They saw ones about Judas in verse 16 of Acts 1. Peter talks about Judas and how he was prophesied of in the Psalms. In Peter's first sermon on Pentecost, he proves Jesus with the Messiah through Psalms and Joel. We see that they must have learned so much in that short period, that time when they actually started to really believe. The, the scripture was, was just opening up to them. You don't see them talking that much during the ministry of Christ. Like they're just learning, they're just receiving. But after that, you see them, they do long speeches. You know, they really changed. And it was just when their faith matured after that, that dark period when they, when they had no faith and Something happened to them there. It really changed them. Um, <clears throat> and then, of, of, of course, once they received the promise on the, after Pentecost, um, after they finally went for that believing period, 
the power of the Spirit came on them and they, they were performing those amazing miracles. Let's read about some of the things that they were, they were doing. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Obviously, he wasn't at the initial outpouring, but he still received the same that he got from them. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So it sounds even superstitious. Handkerchiefs from Paul's body that obviously there's no merit in the handkerchief, but you can just see the power that was attending the message, how much faith the people had. They believed that a handkerchief that was in his presence was able to, to heal them. You know, God must have really, really um, been moving on people's hearts to give them that much faith. And again, and they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So just Peter's shadow people thought was going to heal them. I don't know if it actually did or not, but you can just see the excitement and the faith people had there, waiting for Peter's shadow. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So if that was the attention and the, and the faith that people were having of the former reign, which the Bible says was given moderately, how is it going to be with the latter reign? Yeah, it's going to be incredible. The power that God is going to attend the message with is going to be amazing. Yeah. And in Luke 10, we just read here, and the 70 returned. This is, this is, the, this is the, when the 70 were given power, which was just a, a taste of what would come in the, in the pouring out of the Spirit was to happen later. It said, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I behold Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on scorpions, serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by, by any means hurt you. Over all the power of the enemy. Complete, complete domination over the powers of darkness. They can't touch you. But like, you know, when you read that, it really means a lot. He's giving complete power over all Satan's designs to you and your, the work that I'm blessing you with. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So there you see that caution there not to become a bit self-exalted about it. It's, just, it's sort of like what he said about the unprofitable servants. We are, uh, you, you're removing sycamore trees and throwing them in the sea, but remember that you're unprofitable servants. There's always that admonition to remain humble amidst all this. Like, and if you get to that point, you will be worthy of it. Before that power was given to them, their faith was tested, you know, because as we remember what we said earlier, before that, they saw the power of this world greater than the power of God. What they went through in their unbelief and that time when they were weeping and mourning and all that, that, that period there, it really, in a way, it really did actually help them. It really... and. It was another way of stripping their self-sufficiency to realizing how weak they were, you know, that they, they believed, you know, you know, how, you know, Jesus said to them, oh, fools and how slow of heart not to believe the words of the prophets. We said that to the, world, the ones when they were walking on the road to Emmaus. You know, that really was another stripping of their self-sufficiency that I think they, they needed to go through <clears throat> so they could realize how unprofitable they were how weak they were. It was, you know. So before the loud cry comes, there's got to be some, there's got to be some real rites of passages that cause people have to go through. I don't know what they, I don't know what, they, what, what they're going to be. But think God is going to make things happen that are going to be very difficult. But I don't know, he's, he's got to do something. Like we saw what happened to them. They had to go through that, they had to realize how weak they were, how much lack of faith they actually had. Because we talk about, you know, we, we, we have faith, you know, but until, it, until it's really tested and proven, it just can't be, you know, even to your own self. You don't really know, you know. We don't know ourselves. There's something God has to put us through that's going to bring out some really good things, really powerful things in us that, you know, God's going to breathe, breathe some life into our faith. Um, 
and we have to be ready for for that event you know I'm, I don't know what it will be but because no one who who received that who who's able to be a vessel of that power and glory that will be the loud cry is going to be unworthy of it and just on some of the things that some of those things you know we see these restrictions happening they're nothing to god look look what look what um Alan Joyce, the Qantas CEO, is saying, COVID vaccination will be required to fly. God's people have other means of transport. We read in Acts 8 about the Ethiopian eunuch. And when they were come up to the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip after he baptized the eunuch. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. So he just transported somewhere else. You know, we don't need, we don't need to get on a plane. These things mean nothing to God. Like, the work is going to go forward. You know, we, we're worrying about not being able to go overseas and we don't see through the, the, gla- the darkness here at the moment. We don't know how we're going to do things, but God, God has ways. We just have to trust and, and, and know. When I, when I read these verses here, like in Matthew, Matthew 24, this is a parallel of it. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake and for a testament against them and the Gentiles. You sort of think of that as like something a bit scary, you know. You're going to stand there and you're going to be condemned by all these people. But I don't think there's going to be a trace of fear at all in the people that are standing there giving their testimony to those people. Not, not at all. You know, we, 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 I think we see a lot of these things in the, in the wrong light. You know, those times are going to be a demonstration of the Spirit of God. Fear is going to be entirely absent. It's going to be entirely absent. You know, we, we read, of, read of the the way that the, um, when Paul was on trial, he reasoned completely unrestrained. You know, talking to Festus, who was the governor of Judea. It's like, a, it's like the leader of a country. And, it, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for you. So the, 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 the leader of the entire Judea, the governor, he trembled at Paul's word. Paul, Paul wasn't scared. So God's people, are not, they're not going to be scared when they're, when they're standing before the UN Council of Justice or whatever, you know, for, for the crime of keeping the Sabbath and obeying God's commandments. They're not going to be, they're not going to be scared. They, their face is going to be lit up like an angel and they're going to be causing the, the people, putting them on trial to, trial to tremble. That's how it's going to be. So it's not, it's not going to be like, like we often envision it, I don't think. They'll have that much faith at that time. Look at Peter. James had just been killed. He was with Peter. James had been killed by the sword of Herod. Peter had been thrown in prison. And the next morning he was going to be come out and had the same thing happen to him most likely. And we read about Peter when he's in jail. And, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So he's, he's under heavy arrest. And I behold the and, and behold the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison. You'd think he'd be sleeping lightly enough for a light of an angel to wake him up, but it didn't. And he smote Peter on the side. He had to had to nudge him on the side, and raised him up, saying, "Arise up quickly!" And his chains fell off from his hands. So he 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 wasn't worried at all. He was sleeping like a baby about what was happening, what was going to happen to him, because he he knew that he, now he believed what Jesus said. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Before he was, you know, the Bible says, The wicked fleeth when no man pursueth, but the righteous is bold as a lion. Before they were locked up in a, in a house with bars and doors and no one was around and they were scared. Now he's, now he's surrounded by armed soldiers and he's, he's fast asleep. So I don't think that that time there will be a lot of anguish, really. It'll be more of a time of great power. God's people attending the message. There will be a time of anguish afterwards. You know, we read about Daniel 12, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of pr- trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So the time of trouble which such as never was. So that time will be after the latter rain. During the, you can see my little chart there, that once the plagues are falling, the time of trouble, as I understand it, is nearing the end of those plagues towards the second coming of Christ. 
at that time, there will be a lot of anguish among God's people. The, the latter rain period, they'll, they will be performing miracles and they'll be fearlessly declaring the truth. But we read in Jeremiah, another prophecy about this time. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hand on his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned to, into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that there is none like it. It is the, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So at that time, God's people will be in some serious anguish. But even then, these people would have developed the faith to require to go through that. But the fear won't be of, of the enemy's power then. That's not what their fear is. You know, it's true that in the story of Jake, Jacob and Esau, which, which the Jacob's trouble comes, which is a, it's an <coughs> analogy of, Esau's death threat of coming with all those hundreds of soldiers was the catalyst for Jacob's events. You know, J- Jacob didn't wrestle with, with, an en- with an enemy. He wrestled with God. His concern was his past sins, not the sword of Esau. That's what he wrestled with God about. We read in the Great Controversy, As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him to try them to the uttermost. Their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested. As they review the past, their hopes sink, for in their whole lives they can see little good. They are fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness. So here we can again see that unprofitable servant state. They know themselves to be, you know. Like we don't, we know that our, our, even our Christian experience could have been a lot better than, it, than it, it, it has. You know, our whole lives will see little good. There'll be no, there'll be no um, patting ourselves on the back at that time. Though God's people will be surrounded by enemies who are bent on their destruction, yet the anguish which they suffer is not a dread of persecution for the truth's sake. They fear that every sin has not been repented of and that through some fault in themselves, they shall fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. If they could have the assurance of pardon, they would not shrink from torture or death. See, that's not, that's not what's making them scared. They'd be happy to be tortured and died if, if, if it meant that, that they knew they had a pardon. You know, that's that's quite a strong, strong word there. So death is not the is not the fear. The fear is God's approval. But should they prove unworthy and lose their lives because of their own defects of character, then God's holy name would be reproached. See, it's the reproach of God. They're, they're, they're that holy at that point. Reproaching God is, is everything to them. It's not even their eternal life. It's, it's letting God down. And that's really what our highest thought should be. Because there's no self in that. You know, as I, as I said, the fear of, of the enemy and what he, what they are threatening to do to us, you know, should not, it should not overwhelm us. It's good to know what's going on and, and be aware of it, obviously. But God's, God's our hairs, the hairs of our head are numbered. And God, nothing can happen to us without God allowing it. Nothing can happen to our children without God allowing to it, allowing it to happen. And we're completely safe, you know, under his under his care for us. You know? But not to let these things overwhelm us. You know, there's a real there's a real peace in that. There's a real peace in that. As Hebrews says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Don't let the world and sin get in your life, God says. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And if you don't let those things of the world contaminate your character, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So as things continue to get darker in this world, I think this is something we really have to understand because there is going to be loss. There is going to be, there is going to be martyrdom. There is going to be... Uh, plenty of things that are really going to without without the f- true trust and faith in god and seasoned faith in god things that that, that will destroy the, the the natural man you know you really have to develop this faith because um yeah the way things are looking we're really going to need it okay so i invite you to kneel with me as we close with prayer 
uh, loving and caring Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of encouragement. We know that the very hairs of our head are numbered and that nothing, nothing can happen to us that is outside of your will, that your, you surround your, us with your angels, as, the, as your word says, the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. And not only us, but our families, our loved ones, and, and even the, the people of the world are protected by your, who, who, the people who shun your, your love and mercy. Even they are, are protected by your angels until their cup is finally um, full. But we just thank you for that. And we, we, we pray that you help us repose in that trust as we see things deteriorating. We see the workings of the enemy, which um, appears unstoppable. But we pray that you'll open our eyes as you did to Elijah of the many angels that are greater in power and strength than they. And our faith may behold that. And... Um, and whatever comes, we pray that it will not overwhelm us, but we'll be able to be strong um, and persevere, knowing that re reproaching your name is the is the worst thing we can do. We want to honor your name and that you might account us upon your servants. We might almost always remember that we are unprofitable servants and that our, um, our things that are our duty to do are never to be um, look to but rather to your honor so we ask for your blessing in the rest of this sabbath and thank you in jesus name amen <laughs>